Who are we avoiding in drafts this year? So I just went with like the biggest names that I can think of that I maybe feel a little bit uncomfortable with. You know, Justin Herbert being the first guy on the list because Greg Roman's quarterbacks typically don't throw for a ton of yards. They normally run for a lot of yards. We've seen that with Colin Kaepernick and Tyrod Taylor and Lamar Jackson. And that ain't Justin Herbert. You lose your top two wide receivers, your top tight end. They've got some pieces in there like Lad McConkey that I certainly dig. I know Lindsay likes Hayden Hurst a little bit, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know that we're going to see... Justin Herbert, who was a fantasy stud and was averaging, you know, 20 plus points per game. I I just don't think we're going to see that. Last year, he averaged right around 18. I think that's probably a ceiling uh, for this upcoming season. The only point that I want to make about Justin Herbert, he's fallen so far because of all of the things that you just said, that if you take a swing at him in the 11th round, like, yes, I, I wouldn't just wait and go, hey, in the 11th round, I got Justin Herbert, and now I'm set for the season, and that's my quarterback. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do that. I would definitely back him sure. up. You need other options. There's no yeah, way that so Justin low. Herbert, with all of his talent, is not going to return value on an 11th round draft pick. And then the other guy is Tua to Tungvaloa. And I'm not saying that I think Tua is going to be a bust. Look at his numbers, though. When you look at his home and road splits from a year ago, he scored 19 plus points just five times. He was very unreliable on the road, scoring fewer than 15 points of six of eight games outside of South Florida. That's problematic to me. Is he going to pop in a bunch of weeks? Absolutely. Should Tua Tungvaloa be your starting quarterback on a regular basis? No, he has not been consistent enough to do that, no matter what kind of money he's making in that crazy contract. I agree with you. Let's talk about some running backs here. And I'll go first since I didn't have a Mm -hmm. quarterback. I don't like him at his ADP because of the concerns that I have. He is a guy, Rashad White, that I think obviously had a great fantasy season last year was RB4 in fantasy. I would argue that a lot of his production was propped up by volume. And Mm -hmm. the problem attached to that is that the efficiency was not great. His per attempt numbers were bad. He tied for 46th at running back in yards per attempt at 3.7. And out of the 63 running backs that carried the ball at least 56 times, his rushing grade, PFF, ranked 52nd. His offensive Mm. grade ranked 44th. Let me share with you some of the names that were ranked below him, just so you have an idea of from a grading standpoint, the people who sit down and they say, okay, what was supposed to happen on this play? Did you do it better or worse than you should have done it under the circumstances? Dalvin Cook was the worst. Kenneth Mm. Gainwell, Jamal Williams, Miles Sanders, Joshua Kelly, Damian Pierce, Clyde Edwards-Lair, Javante Williams, Austin Eckler, Roshan Johnson, Kareem Hunt, Rashad White. Like that is not company that he wants to be keeping. He shouldn't be on that list if he's one of the best running backs in the NFL. It's worth having the discussion about whether he even is one of the worst running backs or whether he was just the running back that they used the most. And so therefore his fantasy production was as high as it was. They brought in Bucky Irving. We've talked about Bucky Irving being a guy that you might want to target late in drafts. If you draft Rashad White where he's going, I implore you to please go get Bucky Irving, just in case. So I'm a little bit scared of Rashad White just because he's going so high and I'm not 100% sure that he's worth it. Yeah, I, I don't want to poop on him because I liked him last year and he you know, made me look good. So, you know, you have a, a special place in your heart for guys like that. But I, I understand the issue in terms of like the, the advanced metrics and the things that he was not efficient at. I just hope that the volume remains there uh, in Tampa Bay this season. So I don't have him on my list. One player that I do have on my list is Kyron Williams and it has nothing to do with really the punt return kind of thing. It's just more of they brought in Blake Corum, and I just don't know that his touchdown-to-touch ratio is sustainable. Last year, he scored a touchdown for every 14.1 touches. That was more than Christian McCaffrey. Do you hear my voice going up? That's because that's crazy, and he's not going to do that again. Now, if Corum is more in the mix, does he lose some opportunities on first and second downs near the goal line. I think there's concerns there. I don't really have a lot of Kyron Williams. I think I may have one share in him, and, and that's in a dynasty league. And that's it. I'm a little bit concerned about him. I'm also concerned about Aaron Jones. Now, Aaron Jones was spectacular in the second half of last year. He was awesome. I mean, this guy looked f- fantastic. Whacked my Cowboys in the playoffs. He freaking whacked the Niners. He had like, what, four or five games in a row with 100 yards. He was awesome. But the beginning of the year, he's Banged up and not good. And now you're in Minnesota, different offense, very explosive offense. Get it. Alexander Madison did not do well last year. Uh, Aaron Jones is better than Alexander Madison. I totally get that. Aaron Jones is also entering his age 29 year. And I got a sneaking suspicion that. 
by Chandler than maybe we're expecting. Finally, I think Raheem Mostert is like a regression candidate. And that's an absolute no brainer. It's low hanging fruit. Nobody expects him to be as good as he was last year. In fact, he's dropped so far. And Lindsay will, will agree with this, Uh, that he's almost a bargain at this point. So, Oh no, no, he's a hundred percent a bargain. And I don't not expect him to be as good as he was last year. I'll just say that you're, you're nobody. 21 touchdowns kid. Yeah. I mean, at 21 touchdowns last year, my spidey senses are tingling, especially with Mostert. I just, I mean, the guy scored, more touchdowns last year than he had in his first eight years combined or or some ridiculous stat like that. Uh, just that's not something that he's going to be able to replicate. And um, so if he puts up like RB2, RB3 numbers, that will be a good return on investment because he's not coming off the board very early. I think another player uh, at running back too that I'm avoiding is Tony Pollard, even though he does come yeah. from my beloved Dallas Cowboys. I would not be surprised if Tajay Spears outscores him this year. Uh, there's too many There's too many weapons there in, in the Titans offense now. There's going to be opportunities are going to be spread out too much. I don't even know if he's if he's like a 70-30 guy. I think that could be a 50-50 split with that backfield in, in, in Spears. I agree with you about that. What about wide receivers? Got some big names on here. Last year, okay. I had Devontae Adams on this list. Not for nothing, but Devontae Adams, even though he was the tight end, uh, the, the wide receiver 10, he was not consistent at all. Like he drove you nuts. Did you ever go back and watch Netflix's receiver? I did not. People who did watch that show will remember how frustrating his season was. He sat there and ran route after route after route after route after route where he won and he won and he won and he won. And he was like, throw me the ball. But he does it so nicely. He's not like the guy who's the cancer in the room that's freaking out at the quarterback. He's so nice. But the number of times that the quarterback had to come over to him afterward and be like, buddy, I'm so sorry. I'll get better. I'll work on that. And that poor guy is just like, oh my God, what do I need to do? If you think that that offense is going to be shit, then but maybe did they get, don't did take they him. get significantly better though with Gardner Minshew at quarterback? No, I'm, I mean, well, yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Puka Nakua. First off, I don't think we've talked enough about the fact that he's missed time in the offseason with a knee injury. So, you know, that's something that I have sort of in the back of my mind. You're drafting Puka Nakua at the end of round one or the beginning of round two with the assumption that Cooper Cup is going to miss significant time. Because right. if he doesn't, then Puka Nakua is not going to duplicate what he did last year. And here's the numbers. In 12 games last year, when Cooper Cup was active, Nakua averaged nearly three fewer targets, three and a half fewer catches, and almost 30 fewer yards per game. And his fantasy point total was not nearly as nice as it was when Cup was out. And so Cooper Cup is sneaking up on Puka Nakua. Right now, mm-hmm. on the NFC, NFC data, in terms of ADP, Cooper's like all the all like the sudden a second or third round pick. And he wasn't that a month ago. So he's sneaking up, and he's healthy. He's still Cooper Cup. I can't buy into Puka Nakua uh, as a top 12 or top 15 pick, I'm out. I- I'd rather have Marvin Harrison Jr. I'd rather have Garrett Wilson. Hell, I think I'd rather have Devontae Adams, to be quite honest with you, uh, over Ooh. Puka Nakua. And then the last player is Stefan Diggs. And this one's low-hanging fruit, but low-hanging fruit, sometimes, you know, it's it's the it's the sweetest. And Stefan Diggs has been the alpha for most of his career, right? The guy averages like 160 targets a year. I don't know where those targets are coming from when you're going into an offense that's got Nico Collins and Tank Bell. And, you know, you bring in Joe Mix and you got Dalton Schultz as well. So I don't know where those targets are coming from. And I know that the Texans cut Noah Brown. So that kind of decreases a little bit of the of the depth there at the wide receiver position. You could argue that Nico's the alpha there. And how many times is CJ Stroud going to have to throw the football to satisfy Diggs, Hank, and Nico being consistently good fantasy producers. I don't know that that number exists. He's going to have to throw the ball 700 freaking times. I'll take Diggs as like a a mid to low wide receiver two flex type, but he's no longer an elite fantasy player. Yeah. And that's not where he's going by the way, which is why we're expressing this concern about Steph Diggs. He's going at the end of round three, right? Which is certainly lower than Diggs has gone in the past, but I don't like that range for the unknowns that I am attaching to him. I am with you on Diggs. Diggs is the the one name that I wrote down here. And I don't think it's just tied to targets, though I think that that's certainly part of it. I have questions about him and who he is as a wide receiver at this stage of his career. What we saw at the end of the year last year in Buffalo, you have to at the very least wonder about whether or not there's been a drop off, whether or not, there is a personality clash potential. Mm -hmm. Why was Buffalo so willing to move on without any clear replacements in the room? I think that's highly concerning. That's a red flag. And I do think 
that you have made the point a lot this off season about the fact that they ran the ball a lot more down the stretch. And so the fact that the number of times that he was targeted, like his just opportunity just plummeted. But I think that there is potentially a chance that the reason his opportunity plummeted and they went to the run was because he wasn't playing as well. He wasn't the same wide receiver and they knew that, you know, I'm a huge fan of reception perception and Matt Harmon who charts wide receiver play his reception perception, his success rate versus man had been in the 97th percentile the year before last year, it fell to the 76th percentile for wide receiver. So it's still good, but you were talking about an elite wide receiver that now wins versus man at a much lower clip. Like that's a huge drop off versus zone. He went from the 96th percentile to 67th percentile. And Matt Harmon, again, big fan of his work, charted his whole season and says that he looked at the beginning of the year, those success, those wins and, and the 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 ways in which he was not winning. That ha- It was the exact same at the beginning of the year when he was getting targeted a lot as it was at the end of the year. It wasn't like. Oh, at the beginning, he was great. And then all of a sudden at the end, it fell apart. It was, that's who he was last year. So the offense change might be a product of him and not the other way around. The drop-off was specifically on his deeper routes. Like that there were still things that he could do in the short to intermediate ranges where he did look like Stefan Diggs still. We saw that with Keenan Allen. This is the carrot dangled of optimism is that if Houston says, okay, we're just not going to use you doing all the things that you've always ever done. We're going to look at the things you can still do and we're going to have you run more shorter routes. We're going to condense your route tree, kind of like what the Chargers did with Keenan Allen last year. And he crushed, he crushed. They just took away those deep routes because he had lost a step and maximized the things that he did still do well. And he had tons of fantasy value for us. And he looked like a good wide receiver. If Houston does that with Steph Diggs, then I think that he can still look good. He can still be good. But worth pointing out in this comparison, Keenan didn't have another wide receiver on the field for the majority of the season because Mike Williams is gone half the time that Diggs is going to have to contend with. Keenan still being able to produce from a fantasy standpoint and being a wide receiver one with a limited route tree is not necessarily what we're looking at with Steph Diggs. So for me, there's just, there's too much going on here that feels kind of noisy. And so I'm not placing my eggs in that basket in the range of the draft where you would need to in order to draft Steph Diggs. Moving on to the tight ends. David Njoku was awesome last year. In the second half of the year, he was gangbusters. He was a league winner. Do you know that he averaged 78 yards and scored four touchdowns in five games with Joe Flacco? In six games where Watson was under center, he averaged 38 yards and scored once. That sucks. <laughs> and so yeah. Watson is expected to be under center this year for the Browns, even though, you know, apparently, I don't know, there's some noise about him being a little bit banged up. I have no idea. The Browns made their proverbial bed. They'll have to lie in it there with Deshaun Watson. But I, I expect the Joku's numbers to drop. And I think Lindsay and I have both talked enough about Cole Komet for you guys to know that you should not be drafting him. This is not a situation that is positive for him. He was, you know, a red zone option for Justin Fields last year and for Tyler Bajan at at points. Now you've got a better quarterback under center by a mile in Caleb Williams, who's going to utilize his wide receivers in the vertical passing game. They've got Roma Dunze. We mentioned, of course, Keenan Allen is there. They've got DJ Moore. They brought in Gerald Everett and Shane Waldron likes to use two tight ends. That is going to be a problem for Cole Komet. The target share is going to go down. The red zone opportunities are going to go down. With that, his fantasy value is going to go down. He's a tight end too at best. And I'd probably try to avoid him if I could. 